charge and the forces in motion of individual charges. So today we're going to talk a little bit about electric charge and just a little bit about electric force. Tomorrow we'll go um, full force into electric force with a lot more complex situations. But before we do that, one thing that we like to do in AP Physics 2 is compare electric force a lot to Newton's universal law of gravitation. So I just want to have you play around with this simulation again, just to kind of refresh you, refresh yourselves with the factors and the relationships in gravitational force. So basically trying to figure out, you can alter, as you alter mass, oh, that gets a little annoying. That's okay. I guess I could turn it off, but why would I? I got a little bit annoying, but I can make some good music. trying to look at are the relationships between force, mass, and distance. And again, for force, it is a vector. So you can see that the arrows there and decimal notation. It's kind of like really hard to, I think, really compare them. I think scientific notation makes it a little bit easier just to see what's happening with the actual numbers. Sure, you could play with this for hours and have lots of fun. But just to go over Newton's universal law of gravitation, it's a way of calculating the attraction or gravitational force between two masses. So it's an attraction between two masses. The factors or the calculation involves each of the two masses in kilograms the distance between their centers. So that R in that formula does not stand for this radius. It stands for the distance between the centers of the two objects. So when you see R, don't think about this, don't think about radius, think about distance between objects. <laughs> and then finally, you have Newton's gravitational constant which is a very, very small number. So it's six times 10 to the negative 11th. So really small. And that's why even though we all have masses and we're relatively close to each other, we are not really attracted to each other. Well, most of us are. There's no um, attractive force that's pulling us together other than our mutual adoration. So, in terms of the gravitational force, that's really the formula to calculate. Usually when we talk about gravity on Earth, we have a gravitational um, acceleration that we use to help us calculate that. But this formula is going to look a lot like a formula we're going to talk about a little bit later in class called Coulomb's Law, which you may or may not remember. So based on that formula, I'm going to put a minute on the board. <laughs> Which of these factors have a direct relationship to gravitational force? So could you use your little arrows to point to which ones you would say have a direct relationship to gravitational force? So if they increase, gravitational force increases. And if you don't use, there's going to probably be some pointers you don't use.
And I probably should have included a word in here. I'm going to include a word in here. I'm going to say, just to clarify, which variable. So if it's not a variable, don't put your arrow by. So in other words, if it is a constant, don't identify it. Okay, the two, let's unveil these. So majority of people, again, before I actually said, um, before I actually included this, this variables word, some people had identified G, but since it's a constant, it's not going to change, right? So it does not have a relationship just because it's in numbers, because this is not going to change. Now, when you were playing, um, when I had this, if I can turn on the sound again. So if I increase the mass, the pitch went a little bit higher. So let's call that a direct relationship. The force got bigger, same thing here. So the two masses have a direct relationship. And in the formula, they are in the numerator. So mass one and mass two have a direct relationship. Now, if I increase the distance, the force went down. So the, the distance does not have a direct relationship. So it's just going to be mass one and mass two. We'll eventually talk about the relationship distance has in a little bit. All right. Now, we're going to completely jump away from macroscopic because really looking at masses like this and their attraction is a macroscopic view. We're going to jump back to a little bit of chemistry because we're going to be looking at things at an atomic scale as well. So just to kind of remember, um, just to test your chemistry knowledge a little bit, you don't remember anything at all and want to just play around with an atom, that's fine. But I want you to just play around. See how much you remember about um, the structure of an atom. Protons, neutrons, electrons, atomic numbers. Now, if you have your sound on, it'll let everyone know if you did a good job or not. So protons, eight, neutrons, 10, electrons, 10. So, want you to find the element. So if I just choose a completely random element and if I get it wrong, it'll let everyone know. So if you'd rather just play around with the atom for a little bit, just to try to remember what these different parts are and where they go. You see protons and neutrons go in the nucleus. If I drop an electron, it will go out there. So you can keep on building atoms if you choose. But I would say as an AP student, you should have some fundamental knowledge about protons, neutrons, electrons, atoms, and ions. So I would say play around with this. See how good you can do. I'll give you a few minutes to play around with this before we dig a little bit deeper. Stuff with force and charge. If you don't remember, it's the protons that'll determine what element we're talking about. So one, two, three, four. And this is not neutral.
So I'm sure you can play with this and prove your knowledge at all different levels, but we are going to move on. So eventually in our last unit, we'll actually will come back to protons, neutrons, electrons, atomic numbers. So we are not going to really talk so much about atomic numbers, just really looking at basic charge here. But in our last unit, when we looked at things like um, radiation and half-life, so we'll eventually get back to that. But just if you could draw in these two cases, so case one and case two, could you draw the direction of the electric forces between these two, the top two, in case one, and then case two is completely separate. So what direction are the forces between those two charged particles in, in case one and case two? Okay, so very, very good. Now, majority have the opposite charges attracting and the like charges are telling you, no, you don't have to erase your electric field, your isolines. We'll eventually talk about those on Monday. But again, basic idea, like charges repel opposite charges attract. That is as basic as we can get. Oh, hey, little, oh, you're drawing little chickadees. Nice work. Feel free to make pretty drawings on your slides at all times. Now, this next slide doesn't have a question for you to answer, but if you've ever been in a pear deck before, when it closes, you eventually at the end will get a document shared with you that will have all the slides and all of your responses. So I like to make slides, drawing slides, just in case you like to make notes to yourself digitally, just so if you review this stuff later in your Google Drive, the document that you get, you'll see any little notes that you make. So just like uh, conservation of energy or conservation of momentum, there is a law of conservation of electric charge. So the total charge in the entire universe is constant. Charge cannot be created or destroyed. It's basically transferred from one object to another. And in terms of this unit, what is being transferred is a negative charge or an electron because electrons are easy to gain or lose. So because they are on the outer shells in, the, in an electron cloud or an orbit, because they're further away from the nucleus, that is what's going to be lost or gained by an atom in order for it to change charge. Or I should say a material in order for it to change charge. So it's electrons that we are transferring and that's what we're gonna be dealing with all this unit. So I want to be, does anyone remember what the unit for charge is? If you spell it wrong, that's okay. And if you don't get it wrong, don't get right there. Okay. Got a couple of right answers here. Definitely highlight those. So imagine you walk into someone's house and you think it's really neat. It's like something you would say. So if you walk into someone's house and it's really neat, you could say, hey, that's a cool home you got there. Because it's cool. All right, so eventually we'll talk a bit on next unit about ohms and amps and stuff like that. But just for now, Coulomb is the unit of charge, or it could be um, capital C, if you'd like that. Now, one electron is not one Coulomb. So that's one thing to realize. A proton is not a Coulomb, an electron isn't a Coulomb. 
an electron has a really, really small charge. And a single electron is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th Coulomb. And since it is negative, we put a little negative in front of that. A proton is the same amount of charge, but it's just positive. So there's this idea that charge is quantized. That just means you can't just have a random amount of charge. It has to be a multiple of this thing called the elemental charge. <clears throat> so the elemental charge is sometimes given the letter E and it's 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Cool. So anything that has a charge is a multiple of that number. So this is a constant that would be given to you on a formula sheet. You never have to memorize it. But just realize if anything has a charge, it has to be a multiple of that elemental charge. And anything cannot have less than that elemental charge. And it can't be like 1.5 E. It's always 1 E, 2 E, 3 E, all the way up to millions, billions, and trillions. So, just to test that out, on the next slide here, if the element, elemental charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, which of these are actually possible charges to have? So if it's possible, give a little time. So we know for sure this is definitely one. So remember, it would have to be a multiple of 1.6. Again, the a minute to decide. So if it's not a multiple of 1.6, it cannot be possible. All right. Let me put this up and you can kind of see where we're bunching up here. So over here over 1.6, that is definitely good because it's 1.6. 1.0 would not be a go. Because that's not a multiple of 1.6. Neither is 2.8. 2.8 is bad. So if you think about 1.6 times 2, the next one would be 3.2. Those of you who want with 3.2 over here, there we go. If I add another 1.6 to that, that's going to be 4.8. So 4.8, that is a good one here. If you add another 1.6, what is that 6.4? Oh, sorry, I locked it. 6.4 is going to be good too. And you get the idea. So one point, another 1 1.6 is going to be 8.0. So any of the ones that are multiples of that will definitely work. And I think 9.6 would be the last one. Uh, no, 9.6. So the idea is this idea of it being quantized with that elemental charge just means that charges come in discrete quantities. And it's got to be a multiple of 1.6. All right. Next one here. So here's a little math thing for you to try. So if something has 55 electrons and 43 protons, and we know the elemental charge is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. What's the total charge of the system? So remember, each one of these, each one 
as a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. So each of these, each electron is negative 1.6. Each proton is positive 1.6. Now I already put in this part here, so you can ignore the exponent part. But I want you to figure out what was the charge of that system? Give me a little time to think about it, and then I'll give you a little clue, and maybe it'll help. you're not sure how to go about this, first find the difference in protons and electrons. So that difference is going to be 12. So electrons are winning by 12. Okay, electrons. So take 12 times that charge. Now, the other thing about this, because electrons are winning, you should have a negative number. So if you had a positive number, just because you didn't think about that part, or just didn't think if you needed it, make sure you put the negative in front. And then if you do math it out, you get negative 19 points. So again, just more practice with this idea of the elemental charge and what that means. All right. Now we're gonna go just a little bit into different forms of charging objects. So that was looking at a really small microscopic scale. Look at larger scales. There's a couple of different ways of charging objects. So since we can't really bring um, balloons into school because of latex allergy, this is one way of looking at seeing what's happening at the molecular, I should say atomic level. So these two objects here, the sweater and the balloon, are what are called insulators because charge doesn't really freely flow through these. So with insulators, you can charge by friction. And next week, uh, we'll just do a little something hands-on where you can apply some charge to some different objects. So if you rub these together, <coughs> you charge them by friction. If you just touch them, charge does not get transferred. You actually have to physically rub them against each other. And you'll see that charge in this balloon doesn't get distributed throughout it. It is localized at a location. So it doesn't evenly distribute, it just gets located in one point. So charging by friction is when you take insulators, and I'll explain what an insulator is in a little bit. When one insulator is rubbed across another one and you have a transfer of electrons. And remember, it's electrons or negative charge that's flowing between these two. And if you wanna keep this um, open, you can definitely click on charging by friction and you can have this open <coughs> and play around with it. The other thing you'll see, balloon has a net negative charge. The sweatshirt or sweater has a net positive, so they are attracted. So again, charging by friction, a couple things about it. The big thing is it deals with insulators really rubbing against each other. And again, it's a transfer of electrons from one object to another. Now, the next slide, so this is a true transfer of charge. <coughs> There's a process called polarization, which can involve rearrangement of charge in an object. So this balloon now has a negative charge. When it's brought near the wall, there's a rearrangement of charge within the wall itself. There's no transfer of electrons between these two objects but charge is rearranging. So because this is a negative charge, net negative, the electrons 
within the wall are being repelled. So what's left on this side is a net positive, and there's a net negative away from the wall surface. So now the balloon is attracted to the wall. So in this example here, if I have a neutrally charged object, and I bring a positively charged object close to it, remember it's electrons that are gonna move within that object. So they don't leave, this is still gonna be a neutral object. And the positive charges don't really move, but if you can imagine, the negative charges will reorient themselves. Oh, shoot, I should have had to go the other way. I got confused. The electron should be attracted. I apologize for that. So electrons would be attracted to the positive side. So now, even though this is neutral, there's a net negative on this side and a net positive on that side. So this object has become polarized. Charge has been redistributed. It hasn't gained or lost anything. The charge is just redistributed within that object. So unlike charging by friction, polarization is not losing or gaining any electrons. It's just a little redistribution. Now, charging by contact is another form of charging. So there's charging by friction, which deals with insulators, but charging by contact deals with conductors. And again, I'll kind of explain the difference between these two materials in just a little bit. So if I actually bring two conductors into contact, if I have a positively charged object here, neutral, one that starts out neutral, I'm going to call it neutral over here. We can actually have electrons transfer from one object to another. Not by rubbing, just simply by touching. So if you've ever gotten in a little bit of an electric shock, that is charging by contact. So this would lose electrons, so it would have a net positive charge. So charging by friction, charging by contact are two different ways of charging. There's a third way of charging, and that is called charging by induction. Now, this is a little bit weird. The last one, you actually have to have a charged object touching another one. These two objects start out neutral. I bring a negatively charged object close, not touch it. So in the last one, there was contact between a charged and an uncharged object. But if these two are neutrally charged right now, and they're conductors, I should also make a note of this. This involves conductors too. I'm going to bring a negatively charged object closely here. Electrons are going to want to get as far away from this negatively charged object as possible. So you'll have a net flow of electrons from this object to here. So you'll have a mass migration of electrons. And let me kind of draw, I'm going to draw this guy back in here. And if I separate these two objects now, this one has more electrons. So it has a net negative charge. And this one has less electrons. So it has a net positive charge. So even though both of these started out neutral and there was no transfer from this charged object, we still induce or force a charge to occur in those objects. So charging by induction, charging by contact, and charging by friction are the three modes of charging. So 
just to go back a little bit and talk about the difference between conductors and insulators. The main difference between them is how freely charge flows or can be transferred between atoms, or how quickly, how easily atoms, sorry, electrons can be stripped from these materials. So conductors, electrons are really free to move throughout the whole substance. So conductors, good conductors like metals, because charge can easily flow or be passed along through different atoms. In insulators, electrons are tightly bound. So they really don't flow throughout the material. Yes, by rubbing, we can strip some, but once they're taken off, they're gonna to wanna to stay where they are. So if I reset this again, I can rub these together to strip some electrons, but in the balloon, they're not gonna freely flow to distribute themselves. As opposed to in a conductor, if they were free to move, these electrons would not wanna stay all bunched together. So in a conductor, in a conductor, if I had electrons, excess of electrons, they want to freely distribute all over because they can. In an insulator, they're kind of stuck where they are. They aren't free to move. In a conductor, they are free to distribute all around that object. Now, here are a couple of questions here. If a neutral object, so this is kind of going to be a little bit of a thinking question. If a neutral object is given a positive charge or becomes, rather than saying given, let's just say becomes positively charged. Because I don't want the wording of this to screw you up. If something is given a positive charge, that's the same thing as becoming a positively charged object. So if something becomes positively charged, and also there's a grammar error here, it should be it's not, it is mass. Now thinking about if we are we are super duper, we can measure the mass to an infinite amount. We can really, really determine if any mass at all has been lost or gained at the subatomic level. You can actually see if mass has been gained. So even though we don't have the tools for this in school, imagine we are in the Fermi labs where they split atoms and we can actually measure them. So the thing to remember here is in order to become, so if you go from neutral and you become positively charged, that means you lost an electron. So electrons have an incredibly small mass, but they do have some mass that can be measured. So if you do become positively charged, you have lost a really, really, really small amount of mass. So technically, you have lost. If you become negatively charged, it's because you've gained an electron. And you've gained some mass. And the reason I want you to realize this is because at some point, you're going to have to figure out velocities and kinetic energies of electrons. So it's important that we realize that electrons do have some mass. And it's a constant that you'll eventually be given, so don't worry about that. But it's really, really small. All right. Now, here's your next question. See if you remember anything about electric force. There are really two factors that um, affect electric force. Actually, there's a, you could say three factors. 
two things. There's really two for a calculation. There's one, uh, uh, I'll say there's two or three, possibly. Put 30 seconds on the clock and see what you do. Because you really guys hit on it, and the biggest ones are charge and distance. And someone had said the square of the distance before, <clears throat> that is really good too. But the amount of charge and the distance between them. So, um, in terms of the charge, I kind of think there's two different factors built in there. One is the sign of the charge, and one is the amount. And that's why I was thinking, oh, it could be two, it could be three. Now, the uh, next side here. So if we say these two are going to be repelled like that with an electric force, because you guys basically said before, like charges are going to be repelled. Can you draw the relative size of the forces down there? Because it's still going to be repelled. Would you say it's going to be bigger, smaller? <clears throat> and then also, do these two, these two have the same size charge, same size force, or would they be different? If you run out of drawing room, I'm sorry. Just gonna throw up a couple of these. Not all of them, just a couple. So, so this person here clearly shows that these are gonna be bigger, and they also say it's the same size. And then this one here basically says that if this is Fe, that this is gonna be twice as much there. Both of those are perfectly correct. We'll eventually get to the formula, but some things that I just want to make you realize is that if these two are the same size. So the reason that these two are the exact same size is because Newton's third law of motion, which says that action and reaction forces are equal to opposite size. So if this one is twice as big, this one has to be twice as big. So these forces are considered action and reaction. This repulsion or attraction are action and reaction forces upon each other. So you know this one on the left is twice as big as this one. They still have the same repulsive force on each other. So if you figure out one of these, so if you calculate this one, you automatically know that one too. So it's not a matter of having to calculate each of those separately. And the way we calculate that is with Coulomb's law. Now this looks like, it's the reason we started out with the gravitational force equation is because the electric force equation looks very similar. Instead of masses, we have charges that are directly related. Instead of a gravitational constant, we have Coulomb's constant, which is a lot bigger. It's not a negative exponent, it's a positive exponent there. And then it's related to the inverse of the square of the distance. So again, distance is inverse square. You have two directly related quantities, not mass this time, but charge. 
and then the constant is all usually I would actually say anytime you calculate it nine times ten to the ninth is what I'd use and that's really easy makes it a lot easier to remember you have a lot of other things in your head but that'll at least make the math easier um, same thing usually with gravity when we eventually get to gravity even though the g is usually 9.81 uh, on an ap test if you actually use 10 you'll usually be fine so if you go negative g you round it to 10 you'll usually be very very one other thing the hardest thing about this formula is having to put distance in meters because we're usually dealing with uh, subatomic distances or atomic level distances. So you'll be dealing with some weird distances there or something. All right. Two, um, actually, gonna, yeah, let's just do this. We have three slides left. So I'm actually going to have you try this one. So I want you to try to apply the formula once at least. So um, loss of that. We have nine times ten to the ninth times each charge divided by the square of the distance between them. Could you make a quantitative force diagram? By that I mean draw each object. Draw the direction of the forces between them. And then give each force a number or write the number somewhere by the force. So again, two big things are showing either the traction or repulsion, and then showing and actually calculating the quantity or size of the force. No, I didn't say how much distance there is between them. Let's do a distance, just to make this easy, or let's call it 0 0.1 meters. Sorry, I forgot to put the distance in there.
here my ink. Oh, let's just look at some of these. All right. So again, something around nine times ten to the twelfth is what you'll kind of end up with for your force. Come on. And realize that they're repelling each other, so in opposite directions. If you want a penguin in there, that's always good. And again, the unit for this would be Newton. So on problem sets, don't worry if you forget a Newton or a label, but when you eventually do get to you know, the side take the AP test, do not forget um, Newtons in your labels. All right. So two last questions because rarely will you be asked to actually just calculate this straight. What you're going to be usually asked to do is to figure out what factor the electric force change by, changes by if you alter something. So in this first case here, you have two charges of Q and the distance of R, and you end up with a, an electric force of F. So if you double one of these, so remember, this is a direct relationship to force direct. And this one has an inverse square. So if I just double one of the charges, basically, I double the force. So what I would like you to do is try to go through these next three and figure out by what factor, or I should say in terms of F, what is the new force? So again, in multiple choice questions, AP loves these types of questions where you're not actually using numbers and calculating Coulomb's law. It's really looking at how the factors affect each other. A lot of really great work. And a lot of people are doing good even with the last one, which is nice to see because they're a little bit confused by the last one. We'll go through that. So, this next one with charge, if these are both direct, two times two, it's going to be four times that. Now, if this was just an inverse relationship, this would just be half of the force, but it's inverse square. So it's a square of the inverse, which is going to be one quarter of the force. So not only is the distance inverse, it's an even bigger factor. Now let's look at the last one here. So charge is direct, force is inverse and then squared. So the inverse of one half would be two squared. So even though this looks like it's going to be um, making it smaller, I, I don't want to say make it smaller, it looks like a half is going to somehow counteract that too. Remember, this is inverse. And then when we square that, it's going to be two times four. Or two times four. So really, a lot of the multiple choice type questions that you end up taking that AP test related to Coulomb's law 
will be a lot like this rather than you actually having to use tools, times, and all that stuff. One last slide before we finish up for the day. So could you rank the forces of each of these from greatest to least? So remembering to get the force, it doesn't matter if it's an attractive or repulsive, positive or negative, charge times charge over distance squared. So for example, this first one here, two times one over one squared. So figure out how much each one is and then rank them. I would say, why don't you put your numbers, your rankings over here from least to greatest. So even though these are negative, do not worry about the negative. I'm actually going to drop the negative. Seconds. Final so in terms of the rankings, um, <clears throat> just doing the plugging in the numbers and then looking at the math. The smallest number I got was an eight ninths, so letter B. Next one, letter C ended up being exactly one, so that'd be two. This first one here ended up getting a three, and then, uh, sorry, a two, and then letter D ended up with a three, so that'd be four. So the biggest one. So again, sometimes it's not going to be super often that you'll actually have to plug in and do that whole Coulomb's law calculation. It's really understanding the relationships and the variables and doing comparison. So again, we're able to do that because all these have the exact same constant. So we can factor that completely out if we're trying to compare it. Right. So that is actually it for the notes. What I would like you guys to try to do is see if you can actually get into the problem set couple of ways to try to get in there is clicking on electric charge problems here or going into the electrostatics unit and clicking on this link. And if those aren't working, I'm also going to email them to you, email you that link as well, just to see if that works. Because I do want to see how well it works um, and get some feedback on it. And so I don't have a sense as a teacher, they don't really share with us what it looks like from the student perspective. So I will email those problems out to you. They are not due tomorrow. So it's not necessarily, it's not meant to be homework for tonight. So do not worry about necessarily doing it as homework tonight. We'll eventually have some time tomorrow and actually a little time Friday to do problem sets as well. If you do get to the problem and have questions, please let me know.